Next, we will have the last talk for this session. And this talk will be given by Dr. Xiao Yan Ching. Dr. Xiao is a palliative care consultant at Park City Medical Center, and her interest is in training and education. She was the project lead for the discharge guidance for patients with prognosis of days for palliative care unit in Selayang Hospital 2019, and also contributed to the writing of the subcutaneous management guideline for palliative care unit in Selayang in the year 2020. Today, she will be giving us a lecture on rapid hospital discharge for end-of-life care the current practices and future direction. Please welcome Dr. Xiao. Very good afternoon to all. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Malaysian Hospice Council for the opportunity to deliver a talk on this conference. I'll be talking about rapid hospital discharge for end-of-life care, current practices, and future direction. I'll be covering uh, various terminologies of rapid discharge, its definition, challenges, why rapid discharge is provided, current practices, and the future. Looking at various uh, literatures, uh, different centers over the world call rapid discharge at different names. Some are called fast track discharge, terminal discharge, such as in Singapore and some centers in Malaysia. And in my hospital at Park City Medical Center, uh, I would like to call it HOPE, Hospital Discharge Planning for Patients Who Are at End of Life. A colleague asked me some time ago, can it be called a discharge? And we know for the fact in various hospitals without palliative care services, it is called at own risk discharge, whereby family sign an AOR form and they are left to handle the discharge and care at home by themselves. For the purpose of this talk, it will be called rapid discharge. It is an emergent procedure, so a procedure with some urgency for patients with expected prognosis of hours to days in hospital to return home. This definition is taken from Gamble's et al. and Chong et al. Rapid discharge is time critical as the name suggests. At Slyon Hospital, from the time of decision to bring patient home till the actual discharge takes about three hours. At an oncology ward in a tertiary hospital in Singapore, it takes six hours. And in the University of Liverpool, six hours. Often, the palliative care team organizing rapid discharges do face with various challenges. Why is there such a rush in time? Often we see family members, yes, they agree with patient that the preferred place of death is home. However, they are not ready to care for patient at home. And so they wait until the very last moment to request for a rapid discharge. Uncertainty in prognosis, such as for non-cancer patients, and of course, some late ref referrals to the palliative care team. Rapid discharges also happen in a very sporadic nature, you know, in as much as we would like to plan, uh, it could happen uh, quite sporadically. So it does disrupt the ward routine. Providing a rapid discharge uh, involves a lot of complex coordination. Coordination with the various team members uh, of the unit, medication, transportation, 
um, the documents, the forms, and handing over to the community team. Why rapid discharge? We know that many Malaysians prefer to die at home. According uh, to the survey uh, done by Hospice Malaysia in 2015, 61% of those uh, surveyed indicated home as the preferred place of death. In Singapore, we noticed that 77% preferred to die at home. So, providing rapid discharges is to honour patients' autonomy and preference is an indicator of good death. It has its religious importance. Uh, some Buddhist patients require that the body do not be touched for at least eight hours with prolonged chanting and prayers. Dying at home, some may believe it will help the spirit to be at peace. Dying at home also has some cultural uh, and family importance. It helps family members to fulfill their filial obligation and it could also be a meaningful private time for the family. Current practices. If you search for uh, rapid discharges uh, online, you would be able to find uh, some of the workflows, recommendation, guidance from various institutions. Uh, I'm going to use the rapid discharge guidance by Palliative Care Unit Slayer Hospital to highlight some of the key components uh, in a rapid discharge. Um, I had the opportunity uh, as the working group to develop uh, this guidance. Just an overview of uh, the index uh, of the guidance. Um, we do talk about in general uh, the objectives, definitions. Uh, highlight is given on the roles and responsibilities of the various team members uh, so that uh, everybody could be very clear of their role. And uh, the hope is nothing important uh, is missed uh, during the rapid discharge process. Uh, the key issues. Uh, that I will go through in more details later. And it also involves cat lists uh, as well as uh, the various forms and letters. So the first uh, key component is uh, communication. Issues talked about involve uh, prognosis, or what to expect when a person is dying, information about symptom control, the issues of nutrition and hydration are addressed, oral, eye, skin, and bowel care are also talked about. A second uh, area uh, that is addressed in this guidance is on medications. We know most of our injectable medications used are categorized as DDs, and it's, it's being governed by the poison regulation. So we would like to make sure that all the regulations stated are being followed, such as the regulation on possession of psychotropic substance. We make sure that uh, it is followed Family member possessing the psychotropic substance for administration to a patient must be done in accordance with the direction of a registered medical practitioner. That goes the same to administration. Record is very important that they need to keep a register of the medication used, 
name, strength, uh, time, or when it's being administered. And all of this needs to be documented. And so for all patients uh, discharging, would have a medication diary that uh, talks about the indication, the expected onset of action, and how often uh, they could repeat, and how soon they could repeat the dosing. Information on storage, disposal, return and refill, a more specific uh, dosages and frequency of the medications. And here is a diary uh, for family member to document that date and time uh, of administration. We know that over a short time, uh, much information is given to the family members. So provide written uh, information on a brochure. Care kit. Forms and documents. We have a form, an uh, agreement to care form, which mainly summarizes that uh, the family members uh, understood that they, are ha they have their responsibilities to play, that they will administer, uh, document, store, uh, and return medications according to instruction. And if they have doubts, in terms of medication administration, uh, they could always uh, contact the palliative care team unit. Uh, a memo for police officers with information about uh, the number of syringes and the medications possessed uh, as prescribed, as well with uh, the diagnosis of the patient that could be uh, used uh, for further police uh, documentation after uh, the patient's death. And of course, very important, the handing over uh, of care and information to the community power care services. And this is done via a formal referral uh, and a phone call handover. Patients who leave uh, not under any community service coverage will be followed up by uh, the palliative care unit uh, via phone consultations. Checklist. So uh, to some doctors, they find it really useful to have this checklist to help them not forgetting uh, uh, the important uh, points to be addressed. So that's all uh, on the rapid discharge guidance. Next, we talked about some of the challenges I heard uh, from the community health care providers. In terms of rapid discharges, those that um, are not reviewed or referred to the hospital palliative care team uh, may uh, cause a lot of issues because many of the important communications are not done uh, and much explanation uh, is needed. And so much time uh, is spent to address family distress. And next we could see, according to Chong et al, uh, in their studies, they find that after a rapid discharge, patient needed three times more service contacts from the hospice staff uh, compared to their regular patients. 1.78 contacts per day versus 0.62 contacts per day. We'd just like to spend time um, talking about what happened to patients uh, after rapid discharge. I know this is a very busy slide, uh, but this is taken from uh, Chong et al. And this is data from Salayang Hospital, rapid discharge data from 2017. If we look at the 260 patients 
identified for rapid discharge. 31 patients actually died before they could reach home. And that is about 12% of the total number uh, of discharges identified. Similarly, uh, out of the 36 patients identified for rapid discharge, four didn't make it home. And so that constitutes 11%. Just to highlight, even with the efforts of discharging patients as soon as we could, about 10% of them actually don't get to go home. So according to Chong et al, 76% of their patients uh, actually passed away at home. However, about seven, about seven patients, and that is about 3% of the total number, uh, actually do survive longer. And according to the Salah Young uh, 2017 data, we also see that five out of the 32 patients, that's about 15%, survive longer than a week. So that is uh, the challenge that could be faced uh, surrounding the issue of prognostication. If we look at readmission, that is something to be avoided, but we do see a uh, full readmission in the cohort uh, of Chong et al. versus one patient that is being readmitted by Slayang Hospital. Just some points for us to ponder. In some of the literature that uh, I came across, cost saving was uh, stated as one of the uh, benefit for a rapid discharge, uh, for us to understand that a day of hospital cost in a private hospital in Malaysia for end of life care with medical and nursing uh, assistance may cost about 1,000 to 1,500 per day. And in the Ministry of Health hospitals, even though patients pay minimal amount of fees, but it actually do cost about a thousand to a thousand five ringgit per day for a medical bed use. So being in hospital is costly. However, when we look at the possible cost involved in a rapid discharge, medication, depending on what setting, whether a government setting or a private setting, it costs hundreds. An elastometric bottle for medication infusion costs for ambulance would cost a few hundreds depending on the distance. If a carer is hired, that could also cost 200 per day. And also equipment, uh, rental, and how about the loss of daily income? If adding, summing up all this, it could also come up to about a thousand uh, ringgit per day. So maybe it is not as cost saving as it is thought. There is concern that rapid discharges may encourage late palliative care referrals. Interestingly, uh, looking at uh, the data provided by Chong et al. And I probably need to mention uh, the, the study by Chong et al. is carried out in HCE, of the largest uh, hospice in Singapore, that looks after two thirds of the palliative care patients in Singapore. They find that of their rapid discharges, 76% of the referrals are new patients. And interestingly, uh, the distribution of cancer and non-cancers are near equal, which is 
contradictory to their usual referrals that consists of 80% of cancers versus 20% of non-cancers. So could this tell us that patients for rapid discharge are coming very late? So I think as a hospital palliative care providers, on one hand, we will continue to advocate for early palliative care referrals. On the other, rapid discharge services is needed and it needs to be done well. So as addressed in the earlier parts of this talk, um, the many benefits, as well as we do not want to leave regrets among the bereaved family members, as well the professionals, caregivers, because uh, if the primary team, the non palliative care team are left to do the rapid discharge, uh, there could be many areas uh, which are not uh, addressed and that could really uh, have a devastating implication to our patient as well as family members. Lastly, about the future. Rapid discharge uh, does lead uh, research and quality improvement um, and really looking at uh, the end user uh, to get uh, feedback from the bereaved caregivers whom have utilized the service uh, on the actual service. Do they think that patient has a dignified death? Do they think that all these are still worthwhile? Collaboration between hospital and community hospices whether there could be crossing of palliative care providers, uh, hospital providers doing home visits, visiting patients who are discharged, or community palliative care providers uh, visiting patient and family before the discharge. And together in collaboration, uh, identifying and addressing issues uh, surrounding rapid discharge uh, so that improvement uh, could be done. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Xiao Yanqing. Um, yeah, I think a lot of different units now are moving forward with their plans of uh, starting rapid discharge protocols, um, especially when there's an in-house palliative physician in those hospitals. I myself and Marco have just started this a few months ago and I think the response has been positive so far. <laughs> um, all right, so I think we'll move on to the question and answers session uh, in a bit.